Okay, there's still a bit of uh, people joining us, but uh, my clock says 11.02, so let me start. Uh, my name is Andrew Cardozo. I want to welcome you to this conference call on the upcoming NAFTA negotiations. Thank you for joining us. Um, we have an awesome panel with some very real experience and involvement in NAFTA, and I will turn it over to Sandra Pupatello in a moment uh, to introduce the speakers and moderate the discussion. I just have a couple of administrative issues to cover first. Um, if you have, uh, so number one, if you have a question that you'd like to ask, please send it to us in one of two ways. What we'll do towards the end of the call after this, this, the panelists have spoken is to pull them together and ask them uh, the questions that people have um, on, on sort of common topics. So there are two ways of getting in touch with us. One is by email. You can email us at info at thepearsoncenter.ca. That's info at thepearsoncenter.ca, or you can text us at 613-295-1260. That's 613-295-1260. The second thing I want to just ask you to do is to please mute your phone by pressing star 6. We have over 50 people on the line, so uh, we can expect a fair amount of background noise. So please remember to mute your phone by pressing star six. And with that, I'll turn it over to Sandra Pupatello, the chairperson of the Pearson Center. Many of you will know Sandra as a former minister in the Ontario government and a minister of trade and economic development. So she certainly has uh, first ex first-hand experience dealing with the benefits and challenges of NAFTA. And some of you may know her more recently as one of the regular commenters on power and politics. Over to you, Sandra. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's afternoon for me on the Far East Coast, and we're welcoming all of the, uh, the Pearson Center interested uh, people from across the country this morning. And we're especially welcoming our guests. We're going to make some comments on that, as Andrew's mentioned. I'd like to introduce all three. We're going to be followed up with some commentary from a distinguished guest. That's our ambassador to Canada from Mexico, who's joining our call as well. So I'd like to start with the Honourable Andrew Leslie, the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Foreign Affairs, responsible for Canada-U.S. relations, and he comes by uh, this uh, job uh, with some serious history, a retired general in the Canadian Armed Forces with considerable dealings with his American counterparts, some of whom are now senior officials in the current White House. Next up, we're going to have Monique Smith. Many will remember Monique. Uh, as minister in the Ontario government for many years, her portfolio were, were, she had multiple portfolios, but in particular intergovernmental affairs, which standed her in, uh, stood her in very good stead now as Ontario's government representative in Washington D.C. She's joining us from her hometown in North Bay this morning. A nice break for her uh, outside of Washington. And Earl Fry is a professor of Canadian studies at Brigham University in Utah. He was a special assistant in the office of the U.S. Trade Representative and worked uh, there in the precursor to the FTA in the early 1980s. So we've got three individuals with some serious history on the current discussion. We're asking as the Pearson Center, what are some of these important issues that we need to be aware of and that our government is addressing? Canada, Ontario, uh, Pan-Canadian, and the U.S. What are the main processes that we're going to be seeing going forward? So if I could turn it over to the Honorable Andrew Leslie to lead off. Uh, thanks, Sandra. Um, Andy Leslie here. So I'm just going to quickly gallop through, if you would, not to set the table, but to set one place at the table. NAFTA, 23 years old, as all of you know, modified 11 times in its history, and quite frankly, it's time for modernization. We, Canada, are not asking for this round. Uh, President Trump and his executive are, but quite frankly, we welcome the whole idea of modernizing. And our overarching objectives made very clear by the minister yesterday, both at Ottawa University and at the International Trade Committee meeting, uh, protect NAFTA's record as an engine of job creation and economic growth, and quite frankly, the benefits to Canada, to Mexico, and to the United States have been significant. Uh, unprecedented, actually, in terms of economic growth and job creation. We want to make it more progressive, NAFTA writ large. We want to uphold those elements in NAFTA that are key to our national economic interest and culture. And so uh, the, key, the key negotiating priorities for us are, at the strategic level, strengthening labor and environmental protections in NAFTA, 
bringing them into, quite frankly, this century. Preserving the cultural exemptions and supply management. Cultural exemptions, CBC, bandwidth, um, proportionality of shows that have to be Canadian. And supply management we can talk about, uh, certainly, but uh, we're firm on that. Fully integrating gender rights into the agreement as for all government treaties, trade negotiations, and uh, bills that go to in front of cabinet. Uh, including Indigenous rights in NAFTA, in keeping with our commitment to improve the relationship with Indigenous peoples. Cutting the red tape to make life easier for mainly small and medium-sized businesses. Quite frankly, there's enough red tape in NAFTA to choke a horse right now. And both the President and the Prime Minister have clearly said that they want goods and people to flow more freely and more efficiently back and forth across the border. The whole idea is to maintain security by enhancing the outer perimeter but reducing those barriers to trade along the Canada-U.S. border. And obviously, I, I won't presume to speak for the Mexican-U.S. Uh, situation because we have the Mexican ambassador on the line. Uh, cutting red tape, as I mentioned, is key to that. It's not only at the border, but it's also commonality of red tape um, and standardization of bureaucratic process. And last and certainly not least, maintaining a fair dispute process in NAFTA for Canadians, our businesses, and writ large, our partners. Um, We've been working hard on this since uh, the election of President Trump and his team. We've made literally thousands of interactions, educational forays and sessions with American colleagues. Uh, we have consulted very extensively with uh, all sorts and just about all the Canadian business associations. So that's been sort of my partnership, my focus area, along with talking to uh, a certain uh, tranche of uh, U.S. elected officials. In my case, I seem to be focused on the governors. Personally, I'm well over 20, and writ large, we've spoken to 50. The main message is fact-based, obviously, and it's how much trade goes into a relative state or district or Senate region, uh, what the Canadian investment in each of those particular areas are, what the business focus might be, and um, how many jobs directly depend on Canadian monies flowing into uh, the various uh, U.S. regions, and by the way, you've all heard the commonly repeated uh, mantras, if you would, 35 states have as their single largest trading partner regions in Canada, and uh, over 9 million U.S. jobs are directly dependent on this exchange of goods and services. Just a quick reminder, in 2016, the total U.S. Canada trade in goods and services was uh, $634 billion, and um, the U.S had a trade surplus in goods and services with Canada in 2016 of U.S. $7.7 billion. Uh, the source is not mine. It's from the U.S. Bureau of Economic Analysis. It pays to have friends down in the States. I can go into more numbers if you want, but I think I'll stop there, and uh, thank you for being part of this process. Thank you so much, uh, Andrew, and I think we may have some questions for as we proceed. Can I uh, have Monique uh, Smith on deck? Sure. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, Thanks for including me in this today. I'm happy to be here. Um, I'm not going to echo what uh, the good general has gone through for us. Uh, obviously, Ontario stands uh, shoulder to shoulder with our federal government in our engagement on NAFTA. I'll just give you a little context on the kind of provincial involvement and our engagement. Uh, we, too, have been very much engaged in uh, extending our reach into the U.S., uh, particularly since the new administration came into place. Uh, Prior to that, we've had a Washington office now for four years. I've been there for four years. Um, and we, you know, slowly uh, developed our network across the country. But certainly since the election of President Trump and uh, the growing discussion around NAFTA and trade through the election campaign and since, uh, we have made it our top priority to, do, to be out, doing outreach to and what we've segmented as the 31 states that are kind of priority for Ontario. So for 20 U.S. states, Ontario is the number one export market of all the countries, all the other jurisdictions that they export to. For uh, 20 states, we are number one. For number eight, for another eight, we are number two. And then there are three states where we just have a large number, uh, a, a volume number, but we're not their number num one or number two, so those would be Florida, Texas, or yeah, Florida, Texas, and California. So we've uh, we've been doing outreach to all of those states. The premier has uh, corresponded with them, has had calls with almost all of those governors. Uh, we were also at the NGA, National Governors Association, in June, where the premier saw 21 governors in 36 hours. So it was a bit of a speed dating exercise, uh, but it was very positive. 
we find that at the subnational level, the uh, the governors are very much engaged in economic development and appreciate uh, the importance of trade to their states. Uh, without fail, we have had a very positive interaction with those governors where they have emphasized and played back to us the importance of Canada as their uh, number one export market um, and also just acknowledging and uh, talking through with us the level of integration of our economies. And we think that's a really key point that we've been making all across the country and we've just been raising with, uh, with a number of our colleagues. Uh, we've also, the Premier has been to Atlanta, Chicago, Michigan, uh, Washington, and as I said, Rhode Island for the National Governors Association. Uh, that, all that since January, and uh, we will continue to be doing that, that level of engagement as we get into the negotiations. With respect to the negotiations themselves, the provinces have a seat at, uh, at the table behind the table, so we're, we're very happy that we are um, we are mimicking the process that was uh, upheld during the CETA negotiations. Uh, we will have our representatives in Washington this week as well. Um, the federal government has agreed to regularly debrief the provinces on, on, on the process, on what's going on, what's being talked about. Um, as most of you know on this call, a lot of what happens in these trade negotiations are actually left for implementation at the provincial and state level, which is why we think it's so important that we be a part of these discussions. Um, certainly in our travels and in our discussions, and I travel with the Premier when she's in the States, we've heard a lot of talk about ag, agriculture, dairy. Um, we've heard a lot of talk about intellectual property and uh, technology, acknowledging that NAFTA was drafted long before most of the technology we use on a daily basis was even adopted, so uh, needing to address that. Uh, labor and environment, also issues that we raise. The flow of people and goods is, uh, is very keen to a number of governors and obviously to the province of Ontario. Um, and so we, we find uh, with governors and with our engagement across the U.S. that we're, we're getting a, a good hearing and a real common understanding of what's important on both sides of the border. In June, the Premier was also in, um, in Washington and we met with uh, a number of uh, people on the Hill, congressmen, senators, uh, Senator Orrin Hatch, the chair of the Finance Committee, uh, the, the majority leader in, uh, sorry, the minority leader in the House, uh, Stiney Hoyer, um, as well as a number of members on both sides of the House uh, to talk about trade. And uh, again, very well received. People understand how important trade is. Um, quite frankly, uh, a bit of... Uh, kind of shock and horror of uh, how the administration has been portraying uh, trade with Canada, and so uh, an effort to make sure that we understand that they know how important it is as well. So that's all very positive. Um, so our, uh, our representatives are in Washington this week, ready to go, and uh, I'm happy to discuss um, any questions you may have as, as we move forward. Thanks, Sandra. Thanks so much, Monique, but I'm sure you're going to have some questions. I have some, too. Earl, could I ask you up next? Earl Fry? Thank you very much. Uh, of course, the U.S. objectives are to modernize NAFTA, e-commerce, uh, digital trade, security, data storage, etc., cetera, uh, intellectual property protection, uh, and Chapter 19 dispute settlement mechanism dealing with anti-dumping and countervailing duties. This will be a tough one. Provide greater import relief, what we sort of call contingency protection or surges, also, this will be contentious. Strengthen Buy America provisions, again, contentious. Uh, strengthen government procurement, uh, uh, liberalization at all levels in all three federal systems. Uh, tighten rules of origin, especially in autos and auto parts. Incorporate labor and environmental standards into the body of NAFTA, which I think all three uh, countries will be in agreement uh, to do. The big uh, question mark will be Donald Trump himself, the great unknown. He uh, has an embattled presidency. He wants to be able to claim a huge win, uh, but he does have uh, core constituents who are suspicious of trade accords. He states that the NAFTA renegotiations are not about Canada, but still complains about irritants with Canada, such as dairy. At some point, when we get to contentious issues, he may threaten to walk away from negotiations. He considers the U.S. has a significant advantage, uh, even though it's bringing together the world's number one, number 10, and number 15 economies. The U.S. still accounts for 86% of NAFTA's annual GDP and two-thirds of its population. 
Also knowing that Canada exports three-quarters of its goods to the U.S. and Mexico exports 80%, he feels that this gives the U.S. bargaining uh, leverage. He could, at some point, uh, I hope it won't happen, try to divert the process from trilateral to bilateral negotiations, reviving the hub-and-spoke scenario that worried Brian Mulroney so much in the late 1980s. He has stated that he wants to increase foreign direct investment in the U.S. in order to create more jobs. Would Hub and Spoke help him to attract more FDI from other countries? And can his negotiators use Canadian commitments in CETA with the EU and the TPP to gain concessions from Canada in government procurement, trade in dairy and agricultural products, digital trade, etc.? A big question mark there. So Trump is definitely the wild card in the rene- renegotiations. Uh, he has protectionist advisors such as Stephen Bannon, Peter Navarro, and to a certain extent, Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross, but he also has pro-free trade advisors such as Gary Cohn and the National Economic Council staff and probably uh, Treasury Secretary uh, Stephen Munchen. Uh, In terms of the team itself that will run things, Robert Lighthizer, head of USTR, is familiar with negotiations with Canada, and the day-to-day negotiator, John Melly, is an old and trusted hand at hemispheric trade negotiations. So I think in terms of the day-to-day uh, negotiations, things should go all right. It depends on what might happen in terms of uh, intervention from the White House and also the notion that uh, periodically there's going to be Trump tweets coming in and what impact will that have on the overall negotiations. Thank you. Very good. Thanks so much. And I know we'll have questions for you as well. I want to introduce His Excellency, the Ambassador of Mexico. He's going to make a commentary now. Uh, this is Dionisio Perez Yacome, who was appointed ambassador by President Pena Nieto in June of this year. And he's had a serious history with the president himself, uh, as well as uh, playing other roles within the Mexican government. And we're delighted that the ambassador has joined us. Ambassador? Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. It's a pleasure for me to, to join this conference. And uh, allow me to make very um, brief comments. Um, first, on, on where Mexico stands um, entering into these negotia- negotiations. Ambassador, can I just interrupt for one second? Could I just uh, remind people to press uh, star six on your phones to mute out uh, background noise? Thank you. Sorry, go ahead. Okay. Should I go on? Yes, please do. Okay, so Mexico will enter these negotiations based on three pillars. One is recognizing that the the agreement, NAFTA, has been beneficial for the three countries. Secondly, we recognize, however, that there is room for improvement. As has been mentioned by my predecessors, uh, this was negotiated 23 years ago, and certainly there are areas such as e-commerce, digital economy, and of course certain areas like energy, which uh, Mexico did not include originally, in the agreement that can now be included thanks to uh, reforms that took place in Mexico. Also another example is telecommunications. And the third pillar, we have a very clear objective that the outcome has to be a win-win-win scenario. That is the three countries have uh, to profit from this. Um, Back when we negotiated NAFTA, we had a vision on the benefits, the potential benefits that could be accomplished. 23 years afterwards, now we see uh, that it, the benefits have become a reality. Uh, it's not a perfect agreement, obviously, but, but there are clear benefits and uh, that can be quantified as the numbers uh, that have been mentioned by, by my predecessors. Um, allow me just to mention the case of Mexico, for example, trade increased uh, with the world uh, seven times, 6.5 times, and with NAFTA, with the with, with Canada increased seven times. Um, Canada is now our fourth uh, trading partner. We are Canada's third trading partners. Out of every $100 that we um, export, um, 85 are with U.S. and Canada. And out of $100 that we import, 50 are with the U.S. and Canada. If we look at foreign direct investment, um, how uh, it has evolved with NAFTA back in 1993, we were receiving $2.5 billion, and uh, the average of the last three years uh, has been $34 billion. So it has clearly uh, benefited um, uh, 
the three countries, we have created um, important value chains, um, and, uh, and we uh, look forward to continue improving it and modernizing. It, it's not going to be easy. Of course, we will have good days and we will have not so good days, but we remain optimistic that it's possible to reach a successful agreement, um, ideally by the end of the year. Uh, we have conducted extensive consultations uh, with the different actors in Mexico since February, and we remain open with the, to, to continue interacting with all the participants. We have defined the key objectives, and we, we, um, these are public, as was mentioned at the beginning. It's four objectives, um, and very quickly let me go over them. The first one is to increase North American competitiveness. Basically, it has to do with maintaining preferential access for Mexican goods and services to the market. Uh, to avoid non-discriminatory treatment includes, um, for example, also our desire to increase the categories for temporary entry of business people, to improve the time, transparency, and processes for their entry and seek for innovative mechanisms of labor mobility, among others. The second objective is to advance toward an inclusive and responsible regional trade. Uh, that um, has to do with um, promoting an increased participation of SMEs in the regional supply value chains, to strengthen, as has been mentioned, um, the compliance with national requirements and international commitments in labor, to establish measures to fight corruption in trade and investment, and strengthen dialogue and cooperation between NAFTA countries in trade and environment, and to improve border infrastructure, among other objectives. The third uh, main objective is to grasp the benefits of the 21st century economy. I already mentioned certain um, cases such as energy, telecom, and the digital economy. And finally, the, the fourth objective is to promote certainty in trade and investment. Uh, we consider that it is indispensable to promote and maintain elements that contribute to make a more predictable, um, to achieve more predictability in trade exchanges and investments. And uh, we, will, we, we are ready to, to look at uh, uh, the possibility of modernizing all mechanisms of dispute settlement included in NAFTA that has to do with investor state, state state, and the anti-dumping and countervailing cases to make them more agile, transparent, and effective. So to conclude, let me just say we are ready to start um, the conversations with the U.S. and Canada. We have a very experienced team in, in uh, in Washington, and uh, again, we remain um, optimistic that, that we can reach a successful outcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Uh, Andrew's asked me to lead off uh, with a couple of questions that I hope might, uh, uh, might be some common questions that you may have on the line as well. And I wanted to start with, uh, with Andrew Leslie. Um, the first question uh, for Andrew, and I guess and Monique as, Monique as well, What's the leverage point that you see Canada having in the negotiations here with both, both Mexico and the U.S.? Although we throw in Mexico, it's as if we all know we're really worried about the, you know, the, uh, the big gun in the room, if you will, and that's the U.S. Do we see energy as that leverage point? Uh, is it natural resources generally? And my question for Earl, what do you see from your perch as the biggest risk for Canada uh, in all of this? So maybe I'll start with, uh, with Andrew and then Monique and then Earl. Okay. Um, I take your point about energy. Um, so the U.S., the total trade in U.S. energy in 2016 was uh, around $70 billion, uh, and the U.S. imported about 53 of that. Um, but that's just one facet among several. And so what we have taken pains to research and then explain to not only American elected officials but their industry leaders are some facts. Facts-based discussions are always good. And I think the minister said it very well yesterday. Canada, the U.S., and Mexico, we do stuff together. We build stuff together. And so the United States in the main... Uh, not always, but in the main, uh, gets resources from Canada, provides value added in conjunction with our Mexican partners, and we sell it either to each other or internationally. 
and the number of businesses, the number of political entities, be they states or congressional districts, in which there are billions of dollars of stock coming from Canada into those states or districts in which they provide value added and sell it elsewhere in the continental U.S. or more importantly overseas is nothing less than staggering. So there are multiple leverage points. And yes, everyone wants, I think Vice President Pence said it so well at Rhode Island, everyone wants a win-win-win. Great, and we all do, and that's what we're aiming towards, and I believe it's possible. Yeah, there's a couple of unpredictable elements out there. There's been a little bit of jockeying and pre-negotiation positioning, perfectly understandable, perfectly understandable, no surprises, read the art of the deal, and uh, it's not necessarily Here. what people say, it's what they do. Got a mosquito on your head. That's it for me. Okay, thanks, Andrew. Monique, what, what's your uh, view on that? in terms of uh, what you see as our biggest leverage point? Or maybe you could make a comment, uh, even with your colleagues that you work with, uh, Pan Canada, not just from an Ontario perspective? Sure. Um, I think that, uh, you know, I think the natural resources are definitely one. Um, I, I would echo uh, what Andrew just said about the integration of our economies. I think that is, that is a huge leverage point, and that's something that as we educate people, they become kind of, very uh, abruptly aware of once we kind of raise the it raise the profile of the issue, and and I think what that leads to is also an understanding of just how important jobs are uh, across the United States uh, as a direct result of Canadian investment and integration. So there's the investment piece where you know we've been educating folks along the way about what companies, what Canadian companies, what Ontario companies are located in their district, in their in their state, and how many direct and indirect jobs are tied to those investments. Um, that speaks volume at volume. And then when you just talk about, and particularly, I'll just be colloquial for a second, but and for Ontario, the auto sector. When we talk to some of our Great Lakes states partners. Um, you know, our auto sectors are so integrated, as you well know, Sandra, and so many on this call will know, um, and, you know, when we talk about cars crossing the border seven times before they're finished and all of the details around um, around the supply chain, uh, it becomes incredibly clear that uh, this trading relationship is, is of huge importance and that NAFTA is kind of a, one of the linchpins that holds it together and uh, that we don't want to kind of overthrow the apple cart on this one. We, we we all acknowledge that there needs to be modernization. We all acknowledge that there needs to be um, some changes made. Uh, but I think when you get down to the brass tacks with our U.S. partners um, more closely at the ground level, they recognize that they don't want to jeopardize it. Um, and I just wanted to address uh, something that Earl raised and, and kind of give you a, a kind of a real-life example on our leverage points. Um, Buy America... <laughs> I've been intimately involved in our Buy America battles uh, across the U.S., uh, particularly in New York State and in Texas. And I have to say that the most compelling arguments we've had against Buy America is when we start raising with our, uh, you know, both our business partners and our elected officials how important uh, the Canadian components and investments in their states are um, to the point where, you know, we have legislative officials saying, well, you know, of course, Buy America isn't about you. We know how important you are. It's about other countries, although we tend, you know, then we have to educate them on how we become collateral damage uh, in any of those policies. But I think the most compelling evidence that we've had in battling Buy America, uh, Buy America across the United States has been um, the value of the jobs and the investments that Canadian companies are making and the integration of our two economies. Uh, and for what it's worth, I know I'm interrupting and breaking protocol. I apologize, but that was really well handled by Ontario, that whole issue by America, especially with New York. Well done. Thank you. That's a nice kudos for you, Monique. Um, Earl, uh, on that note, just from your position then, uh, what do you see as Canada's biggest risk? Uh, you know, what do the America, if you were looking at us as Americans, what do you see? I think the risk would be too much intervention by the White House itself, not allowing the negotiating team to go ahead and, and to reach a, a final agreement. Uh, chapter 19 uh, could be a, a problem just like it was in 1987 when the original 
Canada-U.S. free trade agreement was negotiated. I, I worry about that. I worry how much push will come from the U.S. team in terms of saying, Canada, you've made this commitment in CETA, you've made this commitment in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, will you continue to make such a commitment in a uh, uh, renovated NAFTA and how far Canada could go on that? You know, as I said, the most I, I just worry about uh, President Trump as, as being sort of uh, he's the he's a Trump card here. He's a wild card, and we'll just have to see if he sort of stays out of it, allows his negotiating team to go ahead. Uh, then I think we're going to be in pretty good shape. But uh, intervention from time to time from the White House or from the president himself uh, could cause uh, some difficulties. Okay, thank you. And if I may uh, ask that first question of our ambassador on the line from Mexico. Uh, first, I have to say, I'm not certain how Canadians would react if we were subject to the kind of abuse that the Mexicans have had to face uh, uh, through the commentary that we've heard. I, I just have to say that we, uh, I think I speak for a lot of Canadians, where I, just, I don't know how you found the patience, <laughs> the fortitude uh, to withstand that and still be uh, extremely professional in all of your activities in these negotiations. I, I did wonder, we've said very clearly, given Chapter 19, given the whole essence of where you go with tri tribunals when you have difficulties. Uh, the Mexicans haven't said one way or the other that they would walk away or that they would uh, sort of follow Canada on that particular issue. Um, is there, what, what do you see as a backdrop to what do you do when you have to go to another table for negotiation? Okay, well, first uh, let me just quickly say um, our president has been very clear in uh, defending uh, Mexicans, defending Mexican interests, and we will continue to do so uh, in every way we can. Um, now, with regards to um, dispute settlement that, uh, as I mentioned, uh, it is a very important topic for us to have um, a transparent, efficient, and fair uh, systems of dispute settlement in the agreement, because not, we're not talking only about one, we're talking about many. What is important and what we seek is to add predictability uh, to the agreement, to, to, to make sure that the uh, and entrepreneurs know what to expect uh, to the best possible degree. And, uh, and uh, dispute settlement is, of course, uh, one element of this, um, of this uh, equation. And, uh, and, well, and finally, well, we, we are ready to talk about uh, all the issues in, in NAFTA. We are very clear about what uh, we can and uh, we cannot accept, for example, also uh, Minister Guajardo has been very clear in saying we cannot um, accept increased in, in tariffs, we cannot accept increased in quotas, uh, and, um, and we are ready to sit with the U.S. and Canada to look at all the other elements, uh, obviously having in mind the objectives I described to improve uh, the benefits for the three countries. Very good, thank you. Andrew, uh, Andrew Cardozo, our president, over to you. Yeah, okay, there's three questions here I'll go through, and uh, I'll start with the, the one from the Canadian Vintners Association, Asha Hingarani, it sent a question in. The question is as follows. The wine industry was mentioned in the U.S. Trade Representative press release. U.S. wines have 14% of the market share in Canada, and Canadian wines have 0% of the market share in the U.S. The wine industry can't afford to give anything up during the negotiations. The wine industry is met with global affairs. How can we be assured that the Canadian wine industry won't be traded away at the 11th hour? And I would just say this: uh, there's this uh, sector, but the same might go for various other sectors who feel that they could be, um, quote-unquote, traded away at the 11th hour. Uh, maybe um, Andrew and Monique could, uh, uh, could comment on this. Sure. Um, you know, I've probably met with close to 100 business associations or industry leaders across uh, a host of, of uh, streams. Uh, just so everyone speaking from the same sheet of music, if I may, there's 28 negotiating tables as part of the NAFTA renegotiating construct. There's supposed to be seven rounds. Uh, the United States, as you know, is quite keen on getting this done as effectively and efficiently and as quickly as possible. And we're interested in a good deal, just like our Mexican friends are. I won't presume to speak for them, but the ambassadors already mentioned that. Um, they are bookended by the Mexican presidential elections, uh, they being the negotiations in the summer, and, of course, the, uh, the House midterms 
that uh, come up in the same time frame of uh, 2018. Um, this is obviously a complex endeavor. Uh, the good news is we have, in not only in my opinion, but in the opinion of my peers in the House, so that's Randy, the conservative trade critic who knows his biscuits, and Tracy as well from the NDP, who's equally uh, aware and smart and informed. Um, we probably have the best negotiating team of, of that, that it is possible for Canada to have. They have experienced successful in CETA, in a host of international, and not only that, but within the country negotiations. Um, and they understand how to play three-dimensional chess. Um, I don't see anybody being sacrificed on the table at the last minute. There will obviously be some give and take, but there are industries which, for economies of scale, uh, and sensitivities that we Canadians are interested in managing supply and access. And we see no change to that perspective, which is brought by a variety of narrow corporate perspectives in the United States. Now, I know we're talking about wine right now, but one that has come up in common is dairy. And, uh, you know, once again, I'm a former soldier, so kind of like the numbers. And right now, um, uh, just to set set this in context, the uh, in 2016 Canada exported 123 million dollars in dairy products to the U.S. and we imported 557 million. And now this comes from this. These are U.S. trade numbers. They're not our numbers. These are American numbers. That's a five to one ratio. Canada made the tough call, as we've done in other industries of control measures to limit supply. And we don't give any money to these industries, to either dairy or wine right now. But in the United States, at state and federal level, they do give direct subs subsidies, which in turn encourages production, overproduction for the local market, which results in units of output being produced at lower cost and near peer competitors such as in Canada or Mexico, which in turn means they're selling it to their international partners at a lower than normal normalized price, which by the way is called dumping. So these things are complicated, obviously, and I'm pretty confident that our negotiators, I know what they are, are all over the nuances of this. So I got it. I'll shut up now. Well, actually, Andrew, could I ask you to say a little more about the process? You mentioned uh, seven rounds and 28 tables. Um, what's the time frame for all of this? And does that mean that all 28 tables and other 28 sectors, do they all meet seven times? Or, or um, so a little more on that. The cells are the business streams and the table size. And gosh knows why they call it the tables, I guess, because they're sitting on a negotiating table. But... Um, what is of interest is our teams are all up and ready to go. I, I, I'm very confident, having talked to the Mexican ambassador, once again, he'll speak for himself, they're ready to go. It's been interesting to watch the American staffing process for political appointments um, over the last seven or eight months. So I think most would realize that there are some <clears throat> obstacles to getting full staffing in their side. Um, and on average, there's going to be... You know, a session followed by a two- or three-week uh, pause, not a pause in discussions, but pause in the actual formal negotiations, and then get back at it. So that takes us really until January. Um, if there's no resolution by then, then it, in the American system, it's got to go back, and an update has got to be provided, and permission to carry it stops. But it, of note, you'll notice um, in the U.S. and in the executive level, a, a variety, of, I mean, the, the trade authority and Secretary Ross have both come out and said, you know, they themselves now are articulating the need for a complex good deal for all partners, and they're also um, very well aware of the complexity and interlinkages between, I'm making up the numbers, Table 1, Table 17, Table 21, 22, and 28. Uh, so we'll, we'll see how this goes. Uh, I'm optimistic, and I'm I'm pretty convinced that uh, the desire for a win-win-win is starting to emerge loud and clear. In the main, pushed by American interests who have got a better appreciation now of 
what Canada and Mexico provide. Let's not forget that it's taken us 23 years to reach this, I would argue, state of efficiency in terms of a combined economic integrated model. You'll want to unscramble this overnight. Beware of the unintended consequences. And that's a message which Americans are, are now talking to Americans about. Okay, thank you. Uh, Monique Smith, do you have any comments? Sure, yes. On the um, on the wine industry issue, I mean, obviously uh, we hear about that in our travels as well. Um, from the Great Lakes states, it's more about Ontario, and from the West Coast, it's more about B.C. Um, and, you know, what I uh, – we kind of look at the wine issue, uh, the solid lumber issue. I mean, we, we will always have – irritants, for lack of a better terminology, um, in our trade relationships with the U.S. There are always going to be issues where, you know, they somebody gets their knickers in a knot about, about some component of our trade relationship. But I think it's important to realize that it's kind of one of many, and I'm not sure that NAFTA will resolve all trade issues. Um, but I would kind of case in point look at, look at the solid lumber issue. There was certainly a view uh, shared by many that uh, we wanted to try and resolve the softwood lumber issue, get it out of the way uh, before we uh, we got into the NAFTA mis- discussions. Well, you know, they're happening this week and we're not there yet, and it'll continue to bubble along. Discussions will continue to happen. Uh, pressure will continue to be put to bear, and we hope that we do get to an agreement at some point soon. Um, but, you know, these things, it's kind of like life doesn't stop on one file in order to address another. So there will always be concerns. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about uh, what Andrew mentioned about the kind of leadership on the file in the U.S. and, and he was very politely uh, talking about the fact that you know not all players are in place. I think there's a really interesting uh, discussion, and I would love to hear Earl's perspective on this. Sorry, Sandra, I'm just going to ask a question to one of my other colleagues on the line, but. Um, about who actually has the leadership on the NAFTA negotiations, because there was a, a view that uh, that Ross, uh, Secretary Ross, was definitely taking charge on the softwood lumber file. Some people speculated that he was uh, trying to push that through and take charge and show leadership in order that he would then carry um, the NAFTA file. Uh, NAFTA or international trade negotiations are usually carried by the uh, trade negotiator, uh, in this case, Lighthizer, and we understand, just kind of through the grapevine, that there continues to be a bit of a power struggle between Secretary Ross, um, trade negotiator, Lighthizer, and then, of course, the variety of players that were referenced in the White House, uh, Navarro, Bannon, Cohn, and et al. Uh, So I would be interested to hear the U.S. perspective. I mean, this is what we kind of hear sitting down the street in Washington. Uh, but I would be interested to hear from Earl what his perspective is on who actually has the leadership. And I would just say that I also agree with Earl very much on the extent to which um, the drama will come from from the administration, from the president, from his tweets, and uh, and kind of his perspective on how the negotiations are going. Earl Fry, please go ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, Theoretically, uh, Lighthizer you know, should be in charge as head of USTR, and John Melley will lead the day-to-day negotiations. Again, he's uh, deputy in charge of Western Hemisphere Affairs. A lot of experience. That's good. Ross will have somewhat of a role. We'll have to see. Remember, even going back to the negotiation of the Canada-U.S. Free Trade Agreement, it almost broke down. And at the end of the day, it was, it was really Mulroney getting together with Reagan saying, let's get this done. And Reagan told James Baker, get it done. And we finally got it. The big question is, do we get, if we get to that point in the uh, modernization negotiations, will we we'll have the same support coming out of the White House? Ross is considered to be somewhat of a, of a protectionist, uh, but on the other hand, he has said he'd like to see this done before the end of the year. As I said, I have more trust in Lighthizer and Melly running the show uh, than anyone else intervening at the end of the day, at the end of the day where we do have the irritants, uh, you know, will the political leadership uh, in the White House be able to intervene and say, we want this agreement. This is good for us. It will be win, 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 but especially for the U.S. Um, again, Trump does not have much to show in terms of uh, victories during his time as president other than the uh, Supreme Court nominee being accepted. And I think he would like to see a win here. 
but as I also mentioned, he's somewhat unpredictable, uh, much more so than occurred when we negotiated the FTA uh, under uh, Reagan and when we negotiated NAFTA, mostly, as you remember, under George H.W. Bush and then finally under Bill Clinton. So this is more of a question mark, what might be the role of the White House. But in terms of the negotiating tables, USTR will set up interagency teams for each of the issues. They're mostly functional experts. They don't know a whole lot about Canada nor on nor Mexico, and sometimes they'll be making flippant remarks in the U.S. Uh, negotiating uh, team, as happened when I was there, and we basically had to step in and say, no, you don't say that. There's sensitivities in Canada where that, that point of view will not go over. So hopefully we're going to have some leadership in place in terms of understanding the Canadian perspectives, the Mexican perspectives, uh, messages coming from our embassies, uh, some of our experts at state, but was also mentioned our staffing has been very, very thin so far. So Earl, it, as Andrew mentioned, um, our, our strategy has been to talk to every living, breathing elected official and trade official uh, federally and at the state level in the U.S., uh, do you think that's the right uh, approach? And is there yeah, I do. I, uh, as occurred when I was there in, uh, at USTR, the Canadian team will be much better prepared than the U.S. team will be. We were sort of reacting to what the Canadians put forward. It will be a little bit different this time, and, of course, it's trilateral. Uh, but, you know, I, you know I, I am concerned somewhat about the, uh, uh, what might happen at, uh, in the White House itself. Uh, but overall, you know, in terms of, as I said, at the negotiating table, I think we'll be okay. Uh, we'll come up, uh, you know, where we have problems, we'll bracket the text and come back to it later on. And at some point, there's going to have to be an intervention by the highest authorities. And hopefully, as I'm saying, from our, uh, from the U.S. perspective, you know, I'm feeling that the governors are on board. The business community is mostly on board. Most of the delegation in Texas, for example, has sent a message to Trump saying, don't fool with this this agreement with Mexico, you know, so I think you've been right to, to go to the states, uh, to go to the business community, to meet with members of Congress, but there's still the unknown about what comes out at the top level of the White House, and even when we look at Congress down the line, you know, Congress will be intervening behind the scenes to try to protect some of their own constituents and some of the lobbying groups. That will be one element, and then if we do come up with an agreement, will it be accepted? Uh, the, Fortunately, we'll have the fast track for a while still, that, so we'll only need a majority vote in the House and the Senate. But unlike when I was there, you know, some Republicans are now against uh, freer trade, you know, particularly if you look at the Tea Party group or the Freedom Caucus. And so even on Capitol Hill, there may be some question marks there. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got a couple of more questions, and what I'll do is just tell you what they are now, and then we'll have uh, everybody comment. Um, the first is from uh, Susanna Clef Clyburn at the Canadian Chamber of Commerce. Uh, in her speech yesterday, Minister Freeland said that one of the uh, Canada's objectives is to add an Indigenous chapter to NAFTA. Could you outline what such a chapter would include? And the other question is from Terence Hunsley, who is a senior fellow with us at the Pearson Centre. And his comment is in the or his question in the Canadian in the Canada-U.S. free trade agreement. There was a clause that would hamper either government from introducing a new public monopoly unless they compensated any private company uh, currently operating or planning to operate in the market. Uh, this could affect uh, pharmacare, for example. Um, is there such a provision uh, in NAFTA, and would, it, uh, and, and would, would Canada want it removed? And I guess, Andrew Leslie, maybe you would be for both of those. So first on the Indigenous chapter question. By all means. So I, I think all of you are aware of uh, the government, the Liberal government, uh, the importance we place on the relationship with our Indigenous communities, uh, the nation-to-nation -nation dialogues, and uh, the response to that, if I could call it a philosophy, has been uh, very, very supportive um, and supported. And there is a lot of interest amongst um, uh, American indigenous communities, I'm told, uh, to see uh, sort of a mirroring, keeping in mind that is an internal U.S. decision or, or activity to, to decide. Um, but we are going to try, and we're actually going to, in the Canadian context, we're going to build mechanisms to allow their voice to be heard. So 
For example, um, NAFTA negotiations have not yet started, but neither have the Columbia River uh, renegotiations either. But I've spent uh, some time over the last couple of weeks traveling up and down the length of the Columbia River um, uh, basin, talking to the indigenous communities uh, who have not received a single penny in compensatory mechanisms for what happened um, 70 to 80 years ago and who are disadvantaged in terms of resource sharing um, or their ability to progress as viable communities, and that is going to have to be addressed. And there's, very, there's hordes, herds of similar examples which I could go into. So uh, bottom line is uh, I don't yet, none of us yet know We've stated as a goal, there's a couple of operating principles that lie beneath that goal, all of which are linked. But, you know, we've got to let our negotiating team, um, who have uh, such experts amidst them, uh, sit down and see what the art of the possible is with our U.S. friends and Mexican, quite frankly, though I'm not too worried about the Mexican relationship. And, you know, bottom line is I, I'm optimistic that this will receive favorable impact. impact. Okay, and Andrew or uh, Manik, any, any thoughts about anything in the agreement that could hamper something like uh, PharmaCare or any other social insurance program? Uh, Andrew, I, I don't know if you had anything more on that. I think, I think this goes back to Andrew's point earlier of the various uh, tables and kind of the three-dimensional aspects of negotiating. I mean, certainly, uh, you know, we as provinces know what programs we want to see protected uh, and uh, moving into the future. So I think that there will be, there certainly will be uh, discussions being held between the provinces and the federal government on on protecting the possibility of those programs in the future. Um, and and you know, obviously. Canada has an interest in its, uh, particularly on its healthcare side, in ensuring that we continue to support the healthcare that we've become accustomed to. And so, I don't see, I don't see as part of this negotiation losing those uh, those components. Okay. Well, that uh, concludes our, our questions. Thank you very much. Uh, can I ask uh, uh, all four of you to make any closing comments? And maybe we'll start uh, with Ambassador first, and then Earl, Manik, and. Um, and Andrew. Uh, so, Ambassador Perez, you come. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I would say um, from the Mexican side, we have a team ready, an, an experienced team, actually a, a very good um, team that has negotiated several treaties, uh, starting by Minister Guajardo, Under Secretary Baker, and then Ken Smith and Salvador Bejar, the two, the, the chief negotiator and the and the deputy, and we are ready to sit down with U.S. and Canada. Um, I would say um, we see the possibility of uh, concluding negotiations by the year, by the end of the year. But having said that, we will not sacrifice substance uh, for a quick negotiation. And I would uh, close by saying um, something that Andrew mentioned later, uh, earlier on, which uh, has to do. With, uh, Na we should view NAFTA not only as uh, selling uh, between each other, selling goods to each other, but at producing together. I believe we have created in these 23 years important regional value chains uh, that have increased the competitiveness of the region. We should have that in mind, the competitiveness of North America. We are seeing it now in energy. We we are uh, very competitive. We can become more competitive, and obviously in all the other sectors. So um, we are ready to, to talk about uh, things, and uh, hopefully we'll reach a, a successful agreement. Thank you. Thank you, Earl. I think NAFTA has been a success. A slight majority of Americans feel it's been good. And, you know, if you look at what has happened in terms of uh, the economic relationship between the three countries uh, since uh, NAFTA went into effect, I think it's been positive. We certainly have done even more beyond that in terms of the supply chains. As mentioned, uh, we have the potential to be an energy powerhouse. 
Uh, there's so much that can be done, and we live in a relatively safe neighborhood, if I can say that, in terms of looking at the Canada-U.S.-Mexican relationship versus what is going on elsewhere in the world. So I hope we'll be successful in the renegotiation. I think we can do it. I think that President Trump, at the end of the day, could say it's win-win-win, but it's a huge win for the United States, and I would like to see it uh, completed before the end of the year, although I have some doubts about that. But overall, I hope at the end of the day we will have – a uh, new NAFTA, a modernized NAFTA, which will be considered uh, very positively in, in all three member countries. Thank you, Earl. Monique Smith? Yeah, I think that uh, we're, going, we're heading into interesting times. I, I think that uh, in the lead-up to the negotiations, our relationships with the U.S. Have, uh, and Mexico have been made stronger as we do this outreach and as we, as we kind of talk about and uh, – and work together on the integration of our economy. So I think you know that, that we have a win-win-win already, just in the in the lead up to. Uh, I am hopeful that, uh, that we do see a, a quick resolution. Although I have to say that in my gut, I can't believe we have this done by Christmas. Um, but you know, this, these are interesting times. So uh, I think we all look forward to a very interesting fall. And uh, hopefully we'll have an opportunity to share our views as this goes along. Thanks, thanks for including me. Thank you. Uh, sorry about the beeping going on, uh, Andrew Leslie. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Um, look, I think this is um, it's been a forcing function for from the Canadian side for all of us at federal, provincial, municipal, between business, the different streams of business and as well uh, the interaction between our business associations and those of our American and Mexican friends to get together and to talk trade. And amongst the experts and the business owners, there's a realization that there's opportunity out there which can benefit everybody. I agree that there's some unpredictable elements that are out there. Um, on the other hand, you know, it, people have written about how they negotiate by declarative statements which are are full of energy and enthusiasm and a bit of bit of uh, of uh, excitement but in the bottom line is that it's a business decision and if you look at the cold hard math of what's happened with NAFTA it's been a tremendous success for our three countries could it be upgraded modernized absolutely and our, our most excellent negotiators have as top of mind the whole idea of creating the win-win-win condition for all three of our countries. And then together, we'll continue to build stuff, sell it to the rest of the world, and our middle class will continue to thrive collectively. So I'm an optimist. It's going to be complicated. There will be periods of excitement. Um, and we'll be seeking advice from persons such as those who are listening right now and a whole bunch of others. So the fact that the negotiations start uh, very, very shortly um, is, uh, doesn't mean that this dialogue, A, has to die off, nor it should not by any means. Uh, but it just means that the dialogue should be further enhanced. We've got to talk more. And on that note, thank you. Thanks so much to everyone who's been on the call. I want to just close our session, and that beeping is uh, probably someone who's giving us the hint to close the session. Um, I do think I'm going to get a T-shirt printed that says, uh, we build stuff together, and that seems to be the common theme <laughs> from our speakers on the call. Uh, Your uh, Excellency, thanks so much for joining us. Monique and Earl and Andrew, it's very good of, of you to give us some of your time, and you're uh, very important to what's happening in the next the several months for Canada, certainly. So thanks again. Andrew, thanks for organizing. We will have links available for everyone, as well as the recording of this session, and that will come out in an email to you likely by the end of the day tomorrow. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.